everyone. <clears throat> I think there's an incredible opportunity to be talking to you about a theme like exploration. I mean, what could be more fundamentally human than exploration? And if we think about exploration, imagine what it must have been like for us as a species, for our whole history, being in a situation, sitting outside and watching the different phases of the moon and trying to envision what it would be like to explore in that space. And then Kennedy, President Kennedy, in the 1960s declared, we're going to go to the moon. And we're going to go to the moon because it's hard, not because it's easy. And we're going to do it. We're going to accept that challenge. And we're going to accept it. We're not going to postpone it. And we're going to try to make it. And in fact, when I was 16 years old, sure enough, in 1969, we put a person on the moon. And Neil Armstrong, when he stood on the moon and he said, a small step for man, a great leap for mankind, there were 600 million people watching on 1960s technology TVs. And it was brought to you by NASA. And now I work for NASA many years later. And now NASA is talking about sending people to the moon, sending people to Mars. We already sent people to the moon, and now we're going to send people to Mars. And so <laughs> since I've been at NASA, we've had three rovers landing on Mars. And here is the landing of curiosity. We know a lot about Mars now. And what I can tell you from what I've learned, this is the most godforsaken place you could ever imagine. It is dry and dusty and desolate and cold in the most extreme way. The average temperature on Mars is minus 85 degrees Fahrenheit. And on the warmest day, it might be 70 degrees Fahrenheit during the day. And that night, it gets down to minus 100 degrees. So we know about it. We've seen the rovers. We have rovers wandering around on the surface. And we have a fantastic data set now talking about the conditions, letting us know what it's like in the formation of the planet. This hasn't discouraged our NASA colleagues to think about sending people to Mars. But we know, it'll be, we know what it'll be like when they get there. Not only is it going to be incredibly and excruciatingly cold, but there's no air for them to breathe. And if we try to envision a colony for these people, if we try to imagine what it would be like for them, the atmosphere is so thin that if they have a garment failure, if they have a hole in their suit, the pressure is so low that the, all of the liquids in their body will boil because water on Mars boils at 40, de 40 degrees Fahrenheit is the boiling temperature. But we've been to Mars now. All those who've seen The Martian, right? A dramatic film about survival. But for me, it was a celebration of our incredible ingenuity. In the face of adversity, we use our ingenuity. So what was Mark Watney's, what was Mark Watney's real challenge? His real challenge had to do with food, water, and energy. And yet, if we look at Mark Watney's situation here, it was incredibly challenging, but it wasn't real. And yet, now, if we take a realistic look of what the rover looks at when it looks into the sky, we have this amazing picture, because in this picture is a pale blue dot, and we are here. We are on that tiny blue dot that is the Earth. And on the Earth, now, we are challenged in ways that have to do with the fact that the world's population is 7.3 billion people now on the Earth. At the time that we were going to the moon in the 1960s, there were less than half that number of people. It was 3 billion. And if you think about it, not all of the people that we share this Earth with now is 7.3 billion people. In fact, half of them are living in slums and make less than two and a half dollars per day. And it's worse, because climate change 
is changing our weather patterns in ways that we're seeing wildfires, we're seeing horrible droughts, and we're seeing storms that are larger than we've ever known before. And sea level is on the rise. And in fact, we anticipate that at some point, coastal cities are going to be threatened. And this is the real question. What's going to happen when the people in this room that are in their teens are my age in the year 2060? And there are now 9 billion people on the planet. What is the planet going to be like then? What are the circumstances that you're going to have to be challenged by? What are the things that you're going to have to be doing in terms of reaching our goals for wa food, water, and energy? A huge challenge. And what are we going to have to do? Well, to quote Mark Watney, we're going to have to science the shit out of it. And I can tell you, this is going to be one of the most profound things that is going to happen in the history of humanity. So some years ago, we started a project to try to address this massive problem, and we called the project Omega. <laughs> The project is called Omega. It's for coastal cities. Let me tell you how it works. Omega uses protected bays, like San Francisco Bay, vast areas which will get even bigger with sea level rise. And most importantly, they already have wastewater treatment plants that currently dump wastewater into the banks. But for Omega, this wastewater is a resource. Redirected into floating clear plastic tubes to grow microalgae, the fastest growing plants on the planet and the best producers of oil. The algae grow using nutrients in wastewater and they use concentrated CO2 from a source like flue gas, which means Omega treats wastewater and captures and controls a major greenhouse gas. The Omega infrastructure is used for solar electricity and concentrated solar thermal. And in some locations, wave power generators and wind turbines will also provide power. In addition to energy, the Omega offshore platform supports aquaculture and produces high quality food without using land and without using water. In fact, saving water is a big deal. It's estimated that by the year 2030, half of all the people in the world will face water shortages. And the current map of water scarcity shows in red that there are already many places in desperate need of clean water. Adapting methods developed for the space station for recycling water, Omega transforms wastewater into clean water using one-third the energy required to make clean water from seawater. Omega improves the environment by treating wastewater and capturing CO2. It increases the availability of clean drinking water by recycling wastewater, supplies food without competing with agriculture, and it provides solar energy as electricity, heat, and biofuels. All things that help move us toward a green economy and a sustainable society. So this is an artist's conception of the Omega system, and this is an engineer's conception of the Omega system, and this is what we did. We spent four years and $10.8 million from NASA and the California Energy Commission to prove that we could build a system that works. And I can tell you, it really sort of worked. We've got all the components of it. We, we built this system that was controlled and that we could understand how we could get food and water and energy. We solved most of the major technical problems in those four years. So now the issue is, how do we make the system go global? How do we make it go viral so that people everywhere are trying to develop and utilize such a system? Well, clearly NASA wasn't going to do it. So we formed the Omega Global Initiative. And we formed this to be able to 
convince people that the ocean is the right way for us to be pushing this forward. Why? Because it's underutilized, it doesn't use land, and most importantly, because the floating technology will prepare us for sea level rise. So I invite you to go to the website and check out what we're doing. And what we're now doing, primarily, is looking for places around the world where we can build this and make a system. If you think about it, North America, lots of good locations, but a government that's sort of slow. South America. <laughs> South America is also good, but there too, the government may be a little questionable. Africa, kind of the same situation. Lots of good places. They would really benefit from water, food, and energy. The Mediterranean is a very likely place. We've considered possibilities in the Mediterranean, especially on the northern part near um, Greece and near Italy and Spain and France. Great locations. The problem is getting going. The Middle East is OK. India's got a terrible bureaucracy, but perfect locations. <laughs> and finally, we've been looking at the South China Sea. In fact, just the last couple of days, we've submitted a proposal to do a big project in Vietnam in a place called Halong Bay. So there's lots of locations and a lot of work to do to get this going. In order for us to adjust to different parts of the world, we've invited what we call Omega Ambassadors, people from different parts of the world who have expertise, local expertise, that can teach us how to develop technology there, or we teach them, and they are the, then the engineers and the entrepreneurs and the scientists that need to move it forward. And you can see on this graphic that we have people already in lots of different places. But in fact, the most important people that we've been reaching out to is part of the reason I came to talk to you this evening is that we want to talk to people your age. We want to talk to young people that are going to be the future engineers. And to do that, we've started what we call the International Omega Youth Council, the I.O. Youth Council. And these are mostly high school kids who, from about five different countries, we've accepted 25 students from around the world, and they're looking at funding and different locations, and they help with all kinds of data collection for, for potential Omega projects. So the Omega project is really to the stage now where we're looking for people around the world to take this on. And if you'd like to help us, please go to the website and join us. If you're too busy to have any engagement in helping us find information about sites, well, you can donate your lunch money or something to help move projects forward. So listen, we've gone to the moon, a tour de force in technology something that our ancestors never would have dreamed of. And yet in the last 50 years, we've gone to the moon. Right now, we have rovers on Mars. Right now, collecting data about the Martian surface and sending pictures and information back about that planet. And we are there on that pale blue dot. And the issue now is, if you think about the planet Earth, the big issues all have to do with water, food, and energy. And we've made a suggestion about how we might approach this problem, one of many possible avenues that will help us develop systems of systems that will provide answers to these questions for your generation to deal with. It's going to be difficult, and we may fail. Now, you can either accept that, or you can get to work. And really, Failure is not an option. Thank you. <laughs>